Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ankur Patel for this special webinar on Hindu Dvesha, where we will explore this ambient and pervasive phenomenon, look at it from different perspectives, media, academia, social media, movies. Uh, this is gonna be the first of a series of webinars where we'll be exploring this phenomenon in depth. First off, we'll just jump straight into it. I'll introduce our panelists as we progress first. We have Sri Kalyan Vishwanathan, the president of Hindu University of America, a student of Pujya Swami uh, Dayananda Saraswati, and formerly a successful IT professional. He's guiding uh, the growth of Hindu University of America right now. Kalyanji, why don't you let us know what we're in for and get us started? Terrific. Uh, <clears throat> Namaste, everybody. Namaste to all of you who joined today. We're going to go through a very fast uh, uh, webinar, really speaking, today. Let me begin by sharing my screen. We are calling this webinar Hindu Dvesha, Systemic Hindophobia. <clears throat> so we are uh, introducing a term called Hindu Dvesha. Uh, we'll have a lot to say about its uh, relationship with the other term, the cognate term Hindophobia. The sponsoring organizations for this webinar are AHAD, American Hindus Against Defamation, an initiative of the World Hindu Council of America and uh, Dharma Civilization Foundation, uh, also based in Los Angeles, California. Now, we want to start with the question, what is a phobia? What is a phobia? A phobia, very simply, is, a, as per the dictionary, an extreme or irrational fear of or aversion to something. Examples are fear of crowded spaces or confined spaces, fear of heights, fear of spiders, autophobia, fear of solitude, Islamophobia, fear of Islam, Hinduphobia, fear of Hindus or Hinduism. Now, if you look at it in that sense, the question really that arises naturally is, is there or is there not a visceral fear of Hindus or Hinduism really? Is it widespread? You know, after all, what is there to be so scared about the Hindus? The Hindus have not historically threatened anyone. The Hindus have not launched proselytizing missions seeking to convert the entire world. They have not tried to replace other religions, philosophies, and ideologies. They have not tried to conquer and colonize the entire world. They have not enslaved, exterminated whole peoples like others have done. So what is there to be so scared about the Hindus? It's so a very important question. Now, if you look at the two terms, dvesha versus phobia, dvesha comes from Sanskrit, and phobia comes from the Greek phobos. <laughs> and they have an overlapping uh, meaning. So if you look at dvesha, you get dislike and hatred. If you get phobia, you get fear and horror. Where they converge is repulsion and aversion. But they both kind of lead to the same uh, sort of endpoint, repulsion and aversion. They come from two different angles. In Dvesha, it's, it's dislike and hatred that's more prevalent. In phobia, it's fear, terror, or horror that's more uh, at the forefront. So here's a definition. Hindu dvesha is a Sanskrit word. A dvesha is a Sanskrit word meaning aversion, repulsion, or hatred. A deep-rooted emotional response that negatively influences one's perception of the world. But something or some phenomenon in one's world. Hindu dvesha, like systemic racism or anti-Semitism, is an ambient, all-encompassing discourse that denigrates and delegitimizes Hinduism, the Hindu people as it relentlessly problematizes, dehumanizes, demonizes them, them as in the Hindus. Its accusatory rhetoric treats Hindus as objects or patients to be examined and diagnosed. It presupposes and concludes that something about the Hindus and Hinduism is irredeemably bad, wrong, evil, demonic. For example, here is a colonial era, uh, you know, example taken from James Mill's History of British India. Now, every single adjective that's used in this, in this extract have been used to describe the Hindus by James Mill. 
And this book, History of British India, became standard textbook material for all the British uh, who participated in the governance of India in the colonial era. So during the colonial, colonial era, it was perfectly fine to talk about the Hindus in these terms, in, in, you know, just to look at some of these words, degraded, hierarchical, oppressive, wretched, frivolous, savage, barbaric, inconsistent, and on and on, incoherent, ignorant, groveling. Hardly different from monkeys. So this is a, a, a particular way of defining the Hindus. Overall, painting them all with one single brush. Now, if you look at the colonial roots of Hindu Dvesha, here is how it all started, right? There was what happened, and there's a discourse about what happened. There's the colonizer and the colonized. The British were the colonizers. India was colonized. And to use a Marxist lens, they were the exploiters, and India got exploited. Hindus were victims of this exploitation. But the discourse about what happened was transformed, it was different. It was framed differently. The British were presented in their own self definition as emancipators, as civilizers. What were they civilizing? They were, they were solving a problem within India, you know, which is framed in terms of an exploited, exploited divide within India. Yeah. And uh, this construct, the discourse about what happened, is distinct from what really happened. Is one of the remarkable things about this discourse is that the British extracted some forty-five trillion dollars in current day terms over a two hundred year period from India, profoundly impoverishing India, disrupting and destroying its society. However, but they also rewrote the history of India to represent India as a doomed civilization, which could not be redeemed without. European intervention. It's very, very important. This is sort of the roots of how it all began uh, in the colonial era. There are two sources of Hindu dvesha. One comes from Christian theology, the other from enlightened modernity. As for Christian theology, Christianity is a true religion. All others are false religions. Hinduism is a heathen, pagan religion that needs to be eliminated. Hindus need to, need to be saved or emancipated from Hinduism's devilish satanic beliefs. But if you look at enlightened modernity, modernity supersedes tradition, reason supersedes revelation, science supersedes superstition. Hindus need, need to be saved or emancipated from Hinduism's own backwardness and primitivity. So that you can think of this as the right and the left yeah? uh, in contemporary terms. But either way, they came to the same, they come to the same conclusion. So there are two kinds of Hindu Vesha. One is blatant, the other is blind. Blatant is conscious and explicit. Blind is unconscious and implicit. But in both cases, they represent themselves as an unbiased objective truth, a discourse that represents unbiased objective truth about the Hindus, literally relentlessly abuses the Hindus and Hinduism, either deliberately or consciously, and consciously, or unconsciously and repetitively. The ambient pressure that's exist, uh, that is exerted by Hindu dvesha is like this. Something must be done to the Hindus. The Hindus must be secularized, they must be westernized, they must be, they must be anglicized, must be modernized, proselytized, converted, Christianized, Islamized. In any case, at the very least, they must be supervised. In the worst case, they must be silenced. Now, the problem that this ambient pressure that is ex exerted by Hindu Dvesha on the Hindus, the Hindus end up being ashamed and embarrassed of their own tradition. They get confused. They feel accused constantly. They have to be on the defensive, like the California lawsuit against Cisco, for example. And they feel denounced. So this is the ambient pressure of Hindu Dvesha. Now, recognizing Hindu Dvesha, a checklist. Now, there's, a, there's a lot on this slide, but I'll try to wrap it up very quickly. Are the Hindu people a legitimate people? Do they have a right to live as Hindus? Well, blatant Hindu Dvesha would say, no, never. Hindus are not a legitimate people. Blind Hindu Dvesha may, may say, maybe, maybe, but with appropriate oversight. Well, oversight from whom? 
Do Hindu traditions and culture have a legitimate place in contemporary society? Latin Hindu Dvesha would say, not at all. They need to be destroyed, uprooted. Blind Hindu Dvesha would say, maybe they have a legitimate place, but, but they need to be saved or they need to be reformed first. This is the whole reformative uh, approach to Hindu. Can the Hindu speak up as a Hindu or does a Hindu have to be co-opted in order to be legitimate? Latin Hindu Dresha would say, no, the Hindu voice must be silenced. Blind Hindu Dresha would say, maybe they agree and conform. Conform to what exactly? Well, it is the discourse about Hindus generated by those who exert the pressure on Hindus. To what extent have the problems in Hindu society been caused by invasions and colonization, of which during which time the Hindus were completely the victims? Blat and Hindu Dvesha would not even look at it, not even a little. Such questions are taboo, cannot ask them. Either willfully or blindly, never asked by, by blind Hindu Dvesha. So all problems in Hindu society today need to be traced back to some essential aspect of Hinduism. Yes, absolutely. Blat and Hindu Dvesha, it's a core commitment. Every little issue, contemporary issue, must be traced back to some 2,000 or 3,000 year old, old text. And you know, take up some passage and trace it back to that and say that that's the reason why this is happening today. This is at face value very, very absurd because life was very different then, population just much less, a whole different circumstance. Blind Hindu Dvesha somehow assumes Hinduism is the main problem. So it keeps on problematizing Hinduism. Can the problems in Hindu society be addressed by applying principles or values from within Hinduism? No, Hinduism needs to be exterminated. That is Blat and Hindu Dvesha. Blind Hindu Dvesha may be a little more moderate. Maybe, maybe it can be, but not without major reform. Something must be done in terms of reforming Hinduism. Are Hindu efforts to recover and restore their lost or damaged traditions, texts, and cultures that are legitimate? Blat and Hindu Dvesha, no, these efforts must be eliminated. Blind Hindu Dvesha, only to the extent they that they reform and conform. Is there anything positive or valuable that Hinduism has contributed to the world? No. Everything positive has to be appropriated, reassigned, you know, re-allocated re, uh, as having originated from some other part of the world. Blind Hindu Dresha really believes that very little, if anything. If even there was something of value, it was mostly accidental. Okay, so this sort of frames the conversation. And now I uh, want to transition this to uh, 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 some examples. We're going to look at some examples in different, different domains. We'll start with Hindu Dvesha in the academia. And I hand it over to Jay Bansalji. Uh, Ankur, you want to introduce him? Yeah, just quickly. So Dr. Jay Bansal is a long-term karyakarta of the World Hindu Council of America. And he's currently serving as a board member as well as its vice president of education. Dr. Bansal. Uh, thank you, Kalyanji. Thank you, Ananji, uh, uh, Ankurji. Uh, so the title on this slide uh, may appear jarring to a lot of you. Um, after all, you know, we think of academia in some very lofty terms. And uh, why would, you know, the word Hindu Dvesha be appearing next to academia may be a bit, uh, bit jarring to a lot of people. So, you know, when we, when we think of academia, you know, we think of uh, a place where, you know, you have deep philosophical discussions and, uh, you know, dispassionate search for truth. You know, there's not supposed to be any bias or any agenda uh, behind the analysis or behind the, the thought process. It's pure search for truth and due consideration for all the viewpoints before you come to a conclusion. Now, uh, that is a wonderful uh, image of academia that we carry in our heads. Unfortunately, when you look at the Western academics who are engaged in Hindu studies, well, unfortunately, they come across as a cabal of the worst kind. And I have some stronger words in my mind, but I think I'll stick with uh, this one for now. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> So uh, when we talk about Western Indology, 
and uh, I uh, looked up and down and tried to find some some examples that I could share with you, and I could have come up with hundreds, maybe even thousands of uh, quotations from different sources going over the last 200, 250 years. And I picked three just, uh, just to sort of as a representative sample. And here they are from the colonial period. And I'm going to read them word for word just so they stick in your mind. The Hindu, like the eunuch, excels in the qualities of a slave, dissembling, treacherous, mendacious. This comes from James Mill that you met a little bit earlier. The ancient religion of India is totally doomed. If Christianity does not step in, whose fault will it be? This comes from Max Miller. Its, it's gods are misshapen, wild, cruel, lascivious. This comes from uh, a luminary called Oldenburg of the German Indology creed. Now, what is their mission? Their mission is very simply to destroy the Hindu social structure by any means possible, fair or foul. Next slide, please. So you might be wondering, uh, why are we talking about things that were said or written 100 years or 200 years ago? Well, surely that was colonial period and in the now we are in free world and surely things have changed for the better. Well, unfortunately, you would be wrong. Uh, here are three examples from the current era. These are uh, well-respected professors of uh, uh, theology in very highly thought of uh, universities in, uh, in America, and you'll find people like that all over the world, but we picked examples from our own backyard. So first one is from Wendy Doniger, a uh, very well-respected uh, professor at University of Chicago. And uh, this is a statement uh, she makes about Ramayana after Sitaji has been abducted. And it's describing Rama's, uh, Shri Rama's, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the, the uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, mindset at this time. It says, Rama's nightmare is that Sita will be unchaste and the sexually voracious ogresses that lurk inside every good woman in Ramayana expresses that nightmare. Think about that. Think about that for a second. Next one comes from someone, a fellow named Jeffrey Kripal. He is a professor at Emory University. And he says this about Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna was a child molester and he forced homosexual activities upon Vivekananda. Paul Courtright is another luminary from the same university. And he talks about uh, Shri Ganesha in this way. Ganesha remains celibate so as not to compete erotically with his father, a notorious womanizer. Let, let that sink for a moment. Uh, here's another flavor of Western Indology uh, for your consideration. This comes from Sheldon Pollock. He has a double PhD, a tenured professor at Columbia University, very well respected, uh, all sorts of credentials. And he claims himself to be a Sanskrit specialist. And he says, he concludes, Holocaust is the fault of Sanskrit language. How he comes to that conclusion is very convoluted, but it can be summarized uh, in, in few words here. He says, Europe cannot be blamed for the excesses of colonialism or Nazism. They were merely building on the social political poisons that were already present in the Sanskrit language. And he has an open invitation to Western intellectuals. He says they have a responsibility to actively intervene in the uh, Hindu social order to destroy the built-in social poisons in Sanskrit. For many of you, this is probably you're seeing this for the first time. Now, this, this intellectual, he fails to find any connection between the German language and 6 million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. 
He fails to find any connection between the Latin language and the Spanish Inquisition, or between the English language and 300 years of uh, slavery or indentured labor practices, or the Arabic language and the modern Islamic terrorism. And yet he finds connection between Sanskrit and Holocaust. Think about that. What would you say to someone like him? Um, I'm reminded of a uh, quotation by Dr. Uh, Arvind Sharma of McGill University. He says this about the Western Indology. He says, for such an oxymoron as, as Western Indology to survive, someone has to be a moron. To which all I can say is, why shuttle for someone? Why not the whole damn cabal? <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the question is, well, how can they get away with this? It's actually very easy. They have created this echo chamber where they can only listen to each other and not to any uh, outside view. They and how do they do that? They have, they have created a framework uh, by which Hindu studies must be carried out and discourses must be carried out uh, at various places, conferences, and et cetera. And any approach that does not comply with that is considered to be unsound and therefore unacceptable. They will not be allowed to speak at the conferences or uh, have their uh, works published. And Hindu intellectuals are shunned as being too biased. Well, they are just so biased they, they, to protect their uh, Hindu, you know, their, their religion, they will say, come up with anything. In other words, they make the rules, they are the referees, and we are not even allowed to play. That's how the game is played. Now, why should we worry about academia? Uh, it's after all, you know, the ivory tower. Well, not so. In reality, academia has very strong influence on what goes in your school books, how we, uh, things get reported about us in the news media, and what appears in social media and entertainment industry. You'll see some examples of that in the next section and what shows up in online resources like Wikipedia. The reality is academia plays a huge role in how Hindus are perceived in the society and increasingly in the professional ecosystem. Thank you, I'll stop here. Great, thank you, Dr. Bunsel. Now we have Venkat Nagarajan, who is an economist and PhD student at HUA. Take it away. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk about <clears throat> equality labs, and I'm going to illustrate the concept of Hindu Dvesha by using equality labs and social media as examples. So equality labs is an organization for, for though I'm sure many of you have heard of it, but if you don't know, it's an organization that promotes itself as a social justice related organization. But in reality, it's a group that is focused on fomenting hate for certain segments of society, including Hindu Americans. And um, on this first slide, you can see that um, Equality Labs has attempted to brand the entire nation of India as an evil nation that is promoting and, and is promoting a false story of genocide. So when I look at this gory image in the middle and um, assess it in conjunction with all the images on the side, I, I, and I can see extreme hatred and anger and uh, a call, I mean, essentially an implicit call for extermination of Hindus. Um, and, and basically, Equality Labs is very clever because in hiding, it's, <clears throat> it's very good at hiding its ha hate and implicit calls for violence in, in the so-called um, social justice artwork. So let, let's go to the next slide. So, you know, Equality Labs uses three methods of promoting its hatred. And it, it basically produces propaganda reports, articles, and hate-oriented artwork. That's the number one method that it uses. Then number two, it leverages social media to spread its hateful propaganda. And three, it motivates and inspires its social media followers and political allies to weaponize its hateful propaganda. Um, and, and what I'm going to do is in the following slides, I'm going to um, show examples of each of these three modes through which the organization promotes its hatred. 
So number one, um, we're going to talk about its propaganda material. So it, it produced this dubious cast report in 2018. And the, the, this cast report is, is um, <clears throat> based on a, <clears throat> on a tenuous survey. And the survey <clears throat> um, is g given this sort of uh, veneer of objectivity, even though it's highly biased and it's, it's very, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not the least bit objective. Okay, so basically what does this report, which is based on this tenuous survey conclude? It concludes that there's nothing more to Hinduism than caste. And you can see this from this quote that I've taken from the report. Caste is a structure of oppression that affects over 1 billion people across the world. It is a system of religiously codified exclusion that was established in Hindu scripture. The second conclusion of this caste report is that um, it, uh, not the conclusion, but what the second thing that this caste report does is it um, <clears throat> includes false and highly charged accusations about Hindu culture, religion, and society. And this can be gleaned from looking at this quote, caste like race is a social category created in order to exploit a particular group of people while it shares characteristics that are analogous to class and racial systems of oppression it is quite distinct because of its religious origins and the connections it makes between purity, profession, and skin color. So e each of these quotes illustrates the, the bullet points that, that are outlined on this slide. So can we move to the next slide? Um, here's an example of the organization's hate-oriented artwork. And um, you know th th they're very clever. So you can see the word smash. So smash is, you know, a very subtle word, but but it subtly implies violence. So, you know, so they, they use their artwork in a very clever fashion um, to to uh, have, you know, seems to me like implicit call for violence. Okay, let's go to the next next slide, please. Now, this is the example of how they leverage social media. So you can see in this picture that the CEO of uh, Twitter is in the middle of this picture and is surrounded by, I think, various um, members of Equality Labs. And it, it, it clearly illustrates that um, the CEO of Twitter is openly and happily adding credibility to this hate group and their vicious propaganda. The, the picture also <clears throat> highlights the hypocrisy and complete moral bankruptcy of the people who lead these uh, social media companies. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So this, this is a picture of how um, the organization is motivating. This picture illustrates how this organization is motivating its social media followers and political allies to weaponize its hatred. So this organization has succeeded in getting the um, government of California to weaponize its hate. And this, you know, it's basically uh, aiming to get Hindus branded as bigots who should be monitored and controlled. So I, I, I think that it's very important not to be lulled into a um, sense of um, security that, oh, okay, they're just targeting a certain segment of the Hindu population or, um, uh, you know, people who work in the technology area. I, I don't think that is the case. Um, and so <clears throat> they've been very successful. Um, and this slide basically illustrates that. Now, um, I've basically completed my brief presentation on Equality Labs, and I want to go on to illustrate um, Hindu Dvesha and social media. And there are many forms of Hindu Dvesha and social media, but I've just kind of listed three um, examples. One is demeaning and hin insulting Hindu society and religion. Another one is calling for extermination of Hindus via genocide. And a third form is debasing sacred Hindu de deities. So how, how does uh, social media facilitate and propagate Hindu dvesha? Um, it does this by falsely designating Hindu dvesha as a legitimate social justice and human rights discourse. 
And it also does this by stereotyping Hindus as privileged oppressors, thereby justifying the hatred and violence directed at them. So the, the, I think these are very important points to note. And um, the following slides will, will have examples of each type. So here, here's a example of uh, high profile media personalities who have demeaned and insulted Hindus and their culture and religion. So this, is, uh, this lady was an NPR producer and um, she equated Hinduism with piss drinking and dung worshiping. And um, now she's been removed or fired by NPR, but um, th the question um, is, how did she get hired in the first place? Um, because this definitely is not the first time she's expressing comments like this. So um, it's important to um, keep that in mind. And also NPR, um, has hired an individual who used to be a former editor at the Atlantic magazine. And this editor um, has written articles where, where he basically employ, uh, sorry, implied that a large segment of Hindus drink cow urine as an elixir. So he's now <laughs> employed by NPR, a taxpayer funded organization. So it's um, important to kind of be aware of these things. Uh, Go to the next slide. Okay, this is a, um, a slide where um, it's a call for Hindu Holocaust by this individual. And I think this was on Facebook. And um, this individual basically um, got an award from uh, Penguin Random House, uh, which is a publisher. And um, so this is, this is um, these, these, kind of uh, actions do not um, receive, are, are, are not, um, um, re <clears throat> you know, are not greeted with um, censure, but they actually get rewarded for these, taking these kinds of actions. Next, next slide. And then here, here's my last slide, which is a, um, which depicts a, uh, you know, of, uh, which indicates or, or illustrates a vulgar display and description of Hindu deities. And again, this was, I think, on Twitter. This was posted on Twitter. So these are just some examples of how um, forms of Hindu dvesha on social media. Let's, I'll pass it on to the next presenter now. Great, thank you, Venkatji. Um, next, we have Ravi. Uh, Chilika Murray from Los Angeles. He's a speech therapist by profession and also a PhD student at HUA. Uh, namaste all. Uh, Ankur, if you can just confirm it, you can hear me okay? Yep. Thank you, Raviji. Perfect. All right. Thank you all, first of all, for attending the webinar. I also wanted to extend congratulations to DCF and Ahad for uh, bringing attention to uh, this concept called Hindu Dvesha and how it happens in uh, different fields. You know, some of my panelists already discussed a few th things. Uh, as my part, I want to go ahead and uh, specifically bring your attention to Hindu Dvesha that happens in mass media. So if we begin with the question, as you see on the screen, uh, does mass media have any influence on, uh, on people's minds? The answer may vary depending on who you're asking, right? If you ask uh, those who are a little bit observant and analytical, then the answer would be an overwhelming yes. But if you ask those who see this completely from an entertainment perspective, then either consciously or ignorantly, they may say no. However, if you look at some research, many social scientists also concur that uh, media, mass media has significant influence on shaping uh, people's perception on policies, personalities, narratives, etc. Next slide, please. So the mass media can include a lot of things as you see on the screen, but for the purpose of today's webinar, I just wanted to specifically focus on movie industry and maybe a little bit on the streaming platforms. So as you may know, movie industry uh, uh, continues to play a significant role in influencing people's minds, sometimes in a good way or sometimes uh, in a bad way. So in the Indian context though, we, you know, we hear that many attribute this media influence to the globalization effect post 90s. 
but uh, I also watch some older movies. And uh, if we keenly observe, right, even movies before the 90s did their part in portraying anything related to Hindu culture as inferior to that of the Western culture. So while the movie industry continues to do the part, uh, the other media also is doing their own part in promoting this Hindu Dvesha. And uh, the Hindu Dvesha as a phenomenon is observed in Bollywood as, as well as it dwindles down into the regional movie industries. And the same stereotypes again are naturally adopted by even Hollywood. So in the next slide, I'm going to ask you to recognize um, a pattern of Hindu Dvesha uh, and then see if we can identify something. Uh, as you can see, the pattern I think is obvious here. Uh, when I was piling this, I, I only wondered, you know, whether this Tilakdhari Hindu in a negative or a villain role only increases collections at the box office or they put, uh, they create these characters to serve a different purpose. Next slide, please. Uh, I think most of us recognize the movies on this slide and also I don't have to reiterate the point that I'm trying to make. I think the point uh, based on the movies is pretty obvious. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some examples of uh, how Hindu Dvesha is creeping into the, the now very famous streaming platforms. And obviously it's gonna, it, it actually seems that it, it's continuing to grow every day. Next slide. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of so-called, uh, you know, art and freedom of expression. And trust me, when I was uh, compiling this, I came across even more hateful, obscene, and the graphic uh, cartoons out there. I just, uh, you know, couldn't even bear to look at this or share. But again, these are just a couple of other examples. So next slide, please. So what's the point of all this, right? So there is an interesting field called uh, semiotics. So if we analyze these images through this semiotics, uh, what we realize is that, you know, there is a strategic use of symbols. That's what semiotic is actually. Semiotic means how the symbols and signs are interpreted to have a meaning. So what we see that all this uh, specific portrayal has a strategic use of symbolism to create hateful stereotypes against Hindus. I don't know if this happened to you, but once I just happened to put us, uh, uh, my tilak went a little longer, and then my friend gave me this look as if I'm going to, you know, go outside and beat up somebody. So that's the kind of, you know, st a stereotype that people have already created because of uh, these kind of things. And that leads to creating many other tropes and that are commonly used in Hindu hating social media or print media uh, by they're used by the trolls and all sorts of nonsense like you know name calling and labeling and all these kind of things and what we also see is a blatant mockery of, of hindu customs and practices which will increase uh, uh, inferiority complex actually especially among the younger generations of hindus so much so that that they just want to distance themselves from uh, these customs altogether next slide please so I'm going to quickly wrap it up here. Uh, many times, uh, let's think about, you know, why this happens, first of all. So many times there is an inability to actually recognize Hindu Dvesha, either consciously or sometimes innocently also it happens. But if we see, uh, if all these movies and web series are being successful, uh, we cannot deny that, you know, Hindus are actually the main reason. We are the ones who are going uh, to these movies, clapping for these and increasing the TRPs and stuff like that. Uh, and there is a famous dialogue I recall in one of the movies, it goes, hum cake khane ke liye kahin pe bhi ja sakta. Right? We can go anywhere to eat a cake, right? So similarly, what's happening is we Hindus have learned to put up with any level of Hindu dvesha just for the sake of some uh, short-term entertainment. Uh, and also another reason could be, you know, we don't want to react because we always... Uh, want the title of being the good guys, and we don't want anyone to label us otherwise. Uh, I also want to bring your attention to a uh, uh, well-organized and well-funded syndicate that's actually behind creating institutions such as this movie industry or networks, uh, whose only aim is to you know, be creative in inventing and promoting the Hindu Dvesha, not just in India, 
but obviously around the world. And those who indulge in this Hindu dvesha, they're very confident actually that they don't have to face any consequences from Hindus because, you know, unlike others, we are made to believe uh, that uh, in order to be a good Hindu, we just have to be oblivious to these things and bend our heads and uh, walk away. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. And as far as what we can do, uh, first of all, we need to realize that there is no simple solution to this problem. And we just cannot outsource finding solutions to others. We just have to do it ourselves. So we need to improve our awareness and understanding of this concept called Hindu Dvesha, not hesitate to talk about it openly, call it out, express our dissent in a constitutional or a democratic way. And the important thing is to continue to be part of uh, these kind of webinars, educate ourselves and get involved as a community. So with that, I just wanted to end my part. And again, wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity. Thank you, Ravi Ji. Now we have Irvin Swamiji, who is an IT professional and the Director of Administration at Hindu University of America. Irvin Ji. Uh, Dhanyawad Ankur Ji. I hope everyone can uh, hear me okay. So I am continuing the narrative of how Hindu Dvesha exhibits itself in uh, news media. Uh, Venkat Ji talked about social media, Ravi Ji talked about uh, entertainment media, and it happens in the news media also. Uh, together, these news media platforms by uh, overt and covert means, they make it okay for Hindu Dvesha to exist and to proliferate. And they do it in, uh, like I mentioned, uh, in subtle ways uh, with plausible deniability at times. So these are a couple of examples. The cartoons were published in New York Times. On the left side, you see the cartoon that was published during the Mangalyan mission of uh, ISRO. And uh, on the right side, it talks about uh, Modiji's, Prime Minister Modiji's diplomacy, and it uses caricatures, the uh, popular uh, form of uh, God Nat Nataraja. So these may not look like uh, obvious symbols of hate or representation of hate, but if you, uh, if you see why they chose these specific representations, pictorial representations, it means something for Hindus as a civilization and as a culture. And when you look at it from an outsider's perspective, like Hindus may look at uh, God Nataraja as uh, a god, a powerful god, and they may think that Modi is being represented as a powerful god. But do the non-Hindus, do the, does the rest of the world look at it in the same way, or is it making fun of Modi ji and uh, the sacred symbols of Hinduism? Mm -hmm. Right, so that is the subtle plausible uh, with plausible deniability they do it. So these are a couple of examples of that, and we'll see progressively how it can get worse. So in the next slide, you see that on the left side we have Modi ji's picture as it was represented when he won the election on the cover of Times, uh, Time magazine, and on the right side we have uh, Erdogan from Turkey, and how he was represented when uh, he was leading his nation. So in Modiji's case, they had to get a, a picture. Uh, it is not even a real photograph. Uh, and it had to be morphed in such a way that he looks kind of cruel and uncompromising. Whereas uh, Erdogan looks more like a determined uh, business executive. And they even use the uh, title divider in chief for Modiji. Whereas for um, uh, Erdogan, they, they acknowledge that he is a pro-Islamic leader. But in bracket, they emphasize that he is secular, democratic, Western, and friendly. So what the point I am trying to make here is when you look at the image of uh, Modi ji alone on the Time magazine cover, you may think of it as just political commentary. You may not recognize Hindu, Hindu dvesha there. But when you contrast it and compare it with how a leader from a different religion is portrayed, and then you might uh, wonder why that is the case then you may see a difference. You may see what might be the one of the causes for that portrayal could be Hindu Dvesha. So this is another way they do it as a political commentary. Let's move forward. And as you move closer and closer to the core of what it means to be uh, Hindu Dharma or uh, Hindu religion, the religious uh, theological aspects of it, the hatred, uh, the Hindu Dvesha becomes more and more obvious. 
uh, these two are very popular pictures from Washington Post. Uh, it has become a meme. These uh, everyone, most Hindus have seen this. So Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, um, the uh, ISIS uh, leader, was called an austere religious scholar. Whereas um, uh, you, uh, the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Ji, he is called as a militant monk. Now, even though he is a well-educated person with a master's degree in math, he has been a member of parliament, elected multiple times, and he is democratically, he is the leader of that uh, Uttar Pradesh state. So this is where you can see the Hindu Dvesha becoming more and more obvious. Let's move forward. And uh, this is another example. CNN's um, uh, documentary, the, there was a series called Believer, which, uh, which was produced by Reza Aslan. And the very first episode of Believer was on Hindu Dharma. And if you see the subsequent episodes are all on um, not very big religions, not uh, well-known world religions, other than the last one, maybe, which is uh, the Jewish religion. But the other ones, like the doomsday cult in Hawaii, the voodoo in uh, ha Hawaii, and Scientology and Santa Muerte in Mexico. So these are all uh, some obscure cults that they have taken to caricaturize. But when talking about Hindu Dharma, they bring up the Hindu Aghoris. And uh, they use that to represent, uh, they talk about cannibalism and uh, all the different practices of Aghoris. And it's not even represented in the way that the Aghoris themselves might represent. So why was Hindu Dharma portrayed this way? And in one of the subsequent conversations or in, uh, interviews, Reza Aslan himself acknowledged that uh, he went looking, uh, he found the Hinduism that he was looking for to portray. So he deliberately wanted to portray a certain uh, view of Hindu dharma uh, to uh, evoke certain kind of feelings um, in people around the world. Uh, and let's move forward to the next slide. So these are my, this is my final theme of my presentation. And it, Hindu Dvesha becomes most obvious when the media starts talking about uh, Hindu festivals. Uh, this is also something in the past few years we have seen again and again and again. And all the examples that I'm showing here are from media in Bharat, in India itself. Um, how they represent uh, the festivals of uh, Hindus and in contrast, how they represent the festivals of other uh, religions. Um, on the left side, you see that uh, Diwali is called a festival of fats. Uh, whereas for uh, Christmas, uh, they talk about uh, food in uh, much more flattering terms. And uh, it continues with other festivals also. Um, festival of uh, Kadwa Chauth, every year uh, Kadwa Chauth and uh, Raksha Bandhan are considered to be patriarchal representations. Uh, Jalli Kattu and uh, Diwali becomes festival that harasses or that's a cruel practice against um, animals. Uh, whereas Eid, where um, rituals, uh, sacrifice of animals happens on the streets, it's called a feast of sacrifice that the world celebrates. Let's move forward. And these are few more examples of Holi and Navratri. Um, Holi is, a, as you may all recognize, Holi is becoming very popular in the US these days. Uh, it's a fun festival. Everybody wants to participate in it regardless of their uh, cultural and religious background. And because of that, from last year, we have been seeing an attempt to uh, hijack Holi by many different groups, uh, anti-Hindu groups on college campuses and other places within, uh, uh, within the US as well. So um, as we saw in my slides, uh, it starts with in, it happens in many, at many different levels, obvious as well as subtle levels. And the objective of all this by uh, media is to make it okay to have these kinds of attitudes towards um, Hindu dharma, towards Hindu culture, civilization, towards the Hindu people in Bharat, in the US and all over the world. And by again and again showing these represented representations, um, in both subtle and obvious ways, uh, Hindu Dvesha is uh, systemized around the world in the minds of the people. So with that, I uh, conclude my portion of the uh, presentation. Let's move Thank on. Great. Thank you, Arvindji. It's amazing to see everything side by side, isn't it? Our final panelist is Pandita Dr. Indrani Ramprasad, who is a Hindu priest and a fellow of Hindu University of America. Indraniji? 
Om Namaste, Sita Ram, Ram Ram in the tradition of my ancestors. Thanks to Eprison Ankurji and organizers of this webinar, fellow panelists and attendees all. My presentation looks at a small informal stratified survey I conducted to find out how aware Hindus were about the different ways that Hindu Dwesha expresses itself in daily living. Questions were closed and open-ended and the survey was administered online via SurveyMonkey from December 28th to January 13th. Only self-identified Hindus participated. The sample profile, as you see on the first slide, indicates a majority of youths and adults skewered to male, most of the respondents living in America, and the sample fairly representative of the larger Hindu diaspora. Slide two. Here we see how aware were Hindus to Hindu Dweshik actions, words, writings, and behaviors. 50% of the respondents said Hindus had little awareness. 40% said Hindus had a moderate to high awareness. And 10% said they had no awareness. They were totally ignorant. Next slide. The respondents listed, and there are many that they listed, but I've chosen just a few to show some of the Hindu Dwesik words and writings. Intolerant. Hindus were called intolerant. We were called saffron terrorists, kuli, idol worshiper, filthy Brahmin, devil worshiper, Hindutva, RSS, Bhakta, Sativrata, curry munchers, wife killers, heathens, pagans, cow piss, and some of the right. And I must say here, when I came across the word, the one on Bhakta, I was pretty shocked. I mean, I've lived very long in India as a student, and um, I'm from Trinidad in the Caribbean. And, and I thought I always knew Bhakt was a wonderful word. Bhakt was a beautiful word. When did that change? So here are the writings that, that they identified, Marxist, leftist, and conversion writings. Writings that delinked Hinduism from yoga, the Pakistani textbooks with disinformation on Hindus, the American Academy demonizing Hindu deities and civilization, American school books and misrepresentations of Hinduism, next. Some behaviors and actions that they listed. We faced racial oppression, various parts of the world, job discrimination, attacks on tangible Hindu expressions like our mandirs and murtis in India and other countries, bullying, making fun of the deities, vulgar images, Hindu genocide in Pakistan through rape and forced conversion and the aggressive American Christian evangelical thrust of conversion all over the world. America's interference in India's policies via congressional hearings and state resolutions. These were all identified by our respondents. Next. And here we see some manifestations of Hindu dwesha in our living environment. Left on the walls of the Swami Narayan temple in Kentucky, defacing the mandir, academic writings that distort Hinduism and Hindu nationalism online. This was published by Taylor Francis, a very, a very reputable and highly respected house, publishing house. And here, you know, you, you're seeing Hinduism and Hindu nationalism online and Hindutva. On the right, sacred thread of men being cut off, indicating an intent to exterminate the Hindu intellectual and ritual leadership. Pakistani Hindus are forgotten 
genocide, unnoticed by the United Nations and other world bodies. The, a UK report on Hinduism in schools says that the misinformation about Hinduism has led to bullying and racial hate crimes against Hindu children in the schools. Guyana and Fiji, Caribbean countries, especially Guyana and Fiji, uh, 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 sorry, Caribbean countries, especially Guyana. Then we have Fiji, all post-colonial countries where Hindus have consistently been victims of institutional racism and political victimization. Can you recall Uganda in Africa? Next slide. Want to look here at the India and the diaspora, India's history with its foreign invasions, imperialism and colonialism. This should leave us asking, look at the colonialism, the Marxism, the systemic racism and the discrimination. This should, uh, you know, have us asking, who came? What did they do? What, were their, what was their mission? What was the impact on the indigenous peoples? Where did the foreign forces go? Why did they come? When did they come? And how did they fulfill their mission? The who, what, where, why, when, and how we, we use in journalism. February 14, 2019, the suicide bombing of 40 of Central Reserve Police Force in India. This was, this was led by the Pakistan-based terror group. And this should remind humanity of the grander design behind it all. And again, ask the question, who, what, where, why, when, how, how much? The jihadist also released a video describing Hindus as impure, polytheistic, cow urine drinkers. Now we the adults must as far as possible provide all children with a positive environment in which to grow and flourish and to prepare them to identify and counteract any Hindu dwesha they are likely to encounter in their environment. Their self-esteem, their identity and their understanding of Dharma for example, determine their emotional and spiritual health. It determines how they see the world, how they see their place in this world and the cosmos, and therefore how successfully all of us are likely to be in this lifetime on our way to moksha. I end by asking, how aware are we Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Indraniji. Um, before we open it up to Q&A, let's hand it back over to Dr. Bunsal for some contextualizing closing thoughts. We'll uh, take Q&A after that, and uh, we'll drop some more links in the chat about where you can go and get more information as, as we get through this. Uh, Dr. Bunsal? Yes, thank you. Um, so the whole purpose of this first webinar in this series was to give you a bird's eye view of what Hindu dvesha is, where you know, in how it's coming from different domains, um, and what its primary purpose is. Uh, you've heard from a number of different speakers. Uh, no, pre previous slide, please. Uh, you, you heard from a number of uh, speakers about you know these different domains and the, their message, the, the way they are messaging. Uh, the the hateful messages coming from all these places. Uh, the so the, the the key message I want to want you to take away from today's seminars uh, webinar is simply this: Hindu identity is under sustained attack from a variety of directions, be it the academia, be it the entertainment industry, or the news media, whether uh, it's the social media or well organized adversary groups with very deep pockets. They're all attacking our sacred identity. And, uh, and the main purpose is to, sh to shake the Hindu you know, uh, social structure from its roots. Uh, unfortunately, 
and I think this is something we know instinctively, Hindu community by and large remains either unaware or unconcerned or both. And, uh, um, you know, quite frankly, I think this, this, this frog sitting in a uh, pool of water that's being heated from the bottom is probably a good metaphor for where we find ourselves today. It's uh, certainly feeling the warmth, but not the heat yet. And it thinks the water is just perfectly fine. And I will be, you know, I'm in, I'm in heaven. Well, that's one metaphor. The other one that comes to mind, and I won't take too much time, but you know, is that of a pigeon and a cat. You know, they say when a pigeon sees a cat coming towards it, it usually closes its eyes thinking that uh, if I cannot see the cat, the can cat cannot see me either. Unfortunately, cat is not persuaded by that logic. And uh, usually it ends up badly for the pigeon. So um, the next slide, please. <clears throat> so we have a mission in this uh, webinar uh, series. Uh, our mission is very simple. It is to raise the awareness of the Hindu diaspora, of the growing threat around them to their very identity and potentially to their very existence as a society, as a distinct uh, Hindu culture. Um, we plan to hold uh, uh, a, you know, many, many of these webinars on a fairly regular basis. Plan is to uh, do, do them once a month. And we will be exploring a variety of subjects associated with Hindu Dvesha. Uh, so for example, we'll look at the historical roots of uh, this phenomenon and how it manifests itself in uh, schools and colleges. And then we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, how to counter it and, and many, many more subjects. This is, some, this is a dialogue that is long overdue and uh, uh, we are really privileged to bring it uh, to, to the Hindu diaspora and we, we certainly uh, plan to continue it. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you, Dr. Bunsell. Um, we're just over an hour. That was so much information. The chat is filling up with positive uh, uh, affirmations of what we have done so far. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ankur Patel for this special webinar on Hindu Dvesha where we will explore this ambient and pervasive phenomenon, look at it from different perspectives, media, academia, social media, movies. Uh, this is gonna be the first of a series of webinars where we'll be exploring this phenomenon in depth. First off, we'll just jump straight into it. I'll introduce our panelists as we progress. First, we have Sri Kalyan Vishwanathan, the president of Hindu University of America, a student of Pujya Swami uh, Dayananda Saraswati and formerly a successful IT professional. He's guiding uh, the growth of Hindu University of America right now. Kalyanji, why don't you let us know what we're in for and get us started. Terrific. Uh, <clears throat> Namaste everybody. Namaste to all of you who joined today. We're gonna to go through a very fast uh, uh, webinar really speaking today. Let me begin by sharing my screen. 